for coming to us this evening. I wanted to start off with a very small story. Um, Two little mice were walking until they both fell into a bucket of butter. One gave up and drowned, but the other one struggled so hard, he ended up turning that butter into cream and walked out. I thought that was a nice little lesson about today, the Beyond VC's early stage funding for startups, because there's a lot of challenges that um, those that are seeking funding face and today's panel is going to talk about the networks and resources that enable those uh, startups to continue walking their path. I'm first going to provide very brief introductions and then each of our panelists is going to speak more in depth about their work but you can also find their full bios in uh, your program. Right here we have Dr. Olaf Hahn. He is the head of society and culture for the Robert Bosch Zifting, which is based in uh, Germany, the largest leading uh, private philanthropy. C.D. Glenn is uh, the president of uh, African Foundation, uh, excuse me, I don't have my notes yet. <laughs> African Development Foundation, thank you very much. And we have Heather Grady, who's with the Vice President of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. Uh, can you both, can everyone provide just a, a brief background about your experience and what brought you here today? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. So I'm one of the two Germans having come over. So I've, many people have asked me already, well, is that really worth and why you're here? So worth definitely looking at the group and why I'm here. Well, partly to be on the panel, but also to meet some interesting people in the space. So my key topic um, related to Africa is education. So I'm going to talk about that a little later. Let me just give you a little background of the institution I'm working with. So it's, as you've kindly said, the Robert Bosch Foundation, which as you probably all have a car or maybe a washing machine, so you might know Bosch. So Bosch is, um, as you might know, uh, a worldwide active corporate, 380,000 people, um, mainly car supply and automotive. What is less known is that there is a foundation which is not an outspin of um, Bosch, but it, we own it at 92%. So this is why we get the privilege of getting in huge amounts of the dividends that are uh, annually emitted by um, Bosch Limited. And the, uh, the work of the Bosch Foundation is mainly in healthcare, run a couple of institutions, for example, a ho hospital in our hometown of Stuttgart, which is in the southwest of the country. We got an office in Berlin as well. There's education, of course, what we call international understanding, which is several bi and multilateral uh, strands of activities, partly in and with African um, partners. And there's science and social inclusion. So we've been around for 50 years and Africa is sort of new to us. And it's very interesting to be on this panel because the funding of social entrepreneurs is rather difficult if you're a German entity because our legal framework is rather narrow and wouldn't allow direct investments into social businesses, for instance, which is a, an interesting question to us if you look at the disruptive power that some of the um, uh, social businesses that might be represented here. We've been talking about, for example, disruptive um, use of ad tech in one of the discussions we had. So for us, it'd be rather difficult to fund that directly. So what we try to do is to outspin other institutions, allowing us to do that work. And I'll be talking to you a little bit later into that later on. Thank you. Olaf, you mentioned briefly that Robert Bosch Foundation just recently started focusing its work in Africa. Can you describe more about that? Well, it's, thank you, of course. I think it's not easy to describe it. I mean, everybody in the room, I guess, is aware of the challenges. You can find if you say just education all through the life chain, you know, from early childhood to tertiary. And if you're a fund, like us, you know, with a huge record abroad in other jurisdictions, but not the education, you just wonder, well, how do you start in that, you know? So where do you go? Do you dig deep in one jurisdiction? Do you go for, for example, underfunded or not funded, if you find them, NGOs in the space? Do you, we joined, for example, the International Education Funders Group, which is a great group of um, 
foundations doing work in the global south. So we sort of tried to find our, find our entrances, but let me share just some of the thoughts that and, and, and indicate the pathway we then took. Um, so I, as I said, either you go very deep, you, you pick Tanzania and do early childhood and join others, you give your money to another, another fund, for instance, we didn't do that, or you try to be more strategic. And the thing I observe, and let me share that with you, at the example of this gathering, um, it's a business, group, uh, a business group here, people from various backgrounds, but a very business-minded set. If you go to an education uh, conference, a typical education for conference, your voices won't be there, and vice versa. So it's very interesting that the space of education and investments in education, especially in Africa, in my mind, is highly unjoined. So there is no one place you might go to in order to understand who is doing what, what are the key leverages, um, given you know the challenges ahead. We are all aware of the billion people more on the on the continent. Who's going to build those 500 plus universities there? I don't believe it's going to be done in the classical manner, you know, imitating things already there. So what we thought it could be interesting was to try to create a sort of virtual and offline space where a sort of, and forgive me the term, it's just a working term, and we've been around just for six months, so it's really early, a sort of space where you would find um, in an accessible manner uh, uploaded, so to say, by people themselves, so not just from, you know, top down. Um, those um, key drivers of change in the education space that could be really uh, worked on. Um, for example, one thing I've just encountered, I, don't, I think it's a great thing, it's going to be tr um, presented tomorrow, the Speed School Fund, you might have heard of. If you see the amount of people, you know, reached by this, why is this not more known, you know, and there are so many other things. So there's a big deal of mapping in there. For instance, if you go for our case was when we first of all tried to find out what's going on, there is no real way of finding out who is doing what very much on the ground, what's the quality and who might you deliver to. Of course, people know the bigger NGOs, you know, but the ones being really delivering on the ground are less known or not known at all. No internet website, no due diligence, all that. So we've started doing in, so what we've done is we've outfounded a charity in the UK because it's easier to be addressed than to address. It could even develop, as I said before, a commercial um, arm later on to, you know, to cash in uh, the activities we're gonna do. And uh, that charity, which is called Education Sub-Saharan Africa, simply ESSA, that's the, the abbreviation of it. So we started to do a couple of mappings of an interesting kind. So we don't want to imitate UNESCO. Of course, we can't and we shouldn't. But, for example, who are the, which are the important NGOs, as I said? So we started doing that work. We've done a first mapping of the 500 top African businesses, looking at what they do in education. So not education of their own stuff but active in the ecosystem. And yes, you would guess many of those, and that data hasn't been published, we're just working on the report. Many of those um, uh, companies would certainly give out stipends, you know, do that sort of things. But there are some who are trying out to invest in an ecosystem because they understood, they've understood that um, doing this might be the only way of avoiding a mismatch on the labor market in the future. So, and there is a couple of other things like that we want to bring together, that's one. And the second thing is to really contribute to joining up people and what they are doing. One thing I've, let me, allow me to, to quote this from this, an observation from this, um, this conference. In one of the breaks, I had a really impressive conversation with a young lady from, she's not here, I see from Niger. And I, I happen to speak French as well, so we spoke in French. And she says, oh, finally, finalement, on peut parler français? which was very interesting, so, and we all know that Francophone and Anchorphone and Lusophone Africa, there is loads of gaps in there. For example, when I went to see the um, Agence Française de Développement, um, USAID's partners in Paris, I just discovered loads of interesting stuff nobody's aware of because it's not translated. You know, so if we fi find a couple of interesting funding to bring that, you know, to the knowledge of somebody, of, of, of the Anglophone community could be interesting. So joining up people and create that space. And believe me, it's a very fascinating thing to think about big data and social listening and thinking about that space. So that's the stuff we're going to do now. I'm happy to talk you into some more details. Thank you, Fisa. I think that's a great segue.
to Olaf, where you, Robert Bosch Foundation has an interest in investing in education in Africa, but what are the challenges you see to that de desire to do so? Well, I think it has been largely resumed here already. And, uh, I mean, um, finding what you want to fund, you know, getting that right information, putting those things together and really having an impact because it's so huge, you know. And I, I just want to pick on one thing you've been saying, Heather, because you've been talking about the ever-growing philanthropic space in the global south. I think, I think that's, of course, true, and you know much better than I do. But still, for the big ones, you just have a handful, even not in Africa, for instance. Everybody goes and lines up with the Masiiwas and the Dangotis. So it's a very interesting phenomena. Um, if you're looking for partners, the, the, the people queuing up in that line is very, very long. So I believe the decision-making process for the people in charge, um, Tsitsi, for instance, is a very impressive um, procedure. So, and I was wondering a lot around credibility, you know, when, because partly you're going to look for partnerships with these kinds of institutions and people for the credibility on the ground, the experiences they have. Uh, you know, especially if you want to do some pan-African work. So I think that's an interesting interesting point to see how that's going to develop. I, uh, for example, the place I met Almas uh, a couple of months ago was the African Philanthropy um, uh, Forum, which is an outspin of the Global uh, Philanthropy Forum. And if you do that several times, you always meet the same people. So it's a very short, very small um, community still, in, indeed. And I think you really have to be aware of And we've got access, others don't. So I think that's an important point. But to come back to your questions, I mean, we could spend the whole evening and talking about, about the challenges you find. To me, really, it's the, the key thing is for a foundation like ours, where are you going to to get useful information, you know? And I just, I just, it's the point you've just made, you know? It's not in one place, not even in two places, not even in three places. So this is, to me, key. And what are then the drivers of change and where would you invest in best? or advise people to vest, invest in. So this is, to me, this is a key thing. For instance, it's a very interesting comparison that's often done um, when it comes to data. People looking at the health um, um, domain and people say, look at what the Gates Foundation and others have so greatly contributed to. I think it's harder in education because it's, it's, it's less easy than a vaccination, you know? So the pattern, what you want to go for. So this is the thing we want to try and work out on to, to really find that drivers of change and see how an investment could be best done and pe bring people together in that. Listening to you, I was thinking about the, I don't know how many hundreds of conversations I must have had in my career as a grant maker with people, you know? And I think the, the thing that annoyed me most on my side of the table was um, the people were unrealistic. You know, they were promising you whatever out of a grant of 100,000, you know? So I think you shouldn't, you sh one should, um, accept that the counterpart has some experience and insights, but on the other side, um, you often are not so deeply involved in the thing you fund, you know? So it's a, it's a very interesting mixture, and to me, the biggest thing is to really get in contact with somebody and build a relationship, and this is really hard if you're not in this space. I mean, I know it, I mean, the time it took me to have a conversation with Tsitsi, you can imagine, you know, with not having been in this space, but you get there, but others don't. So I think those two things are really important in, in doing it and speaking the language a little bit of the people you're talking to. And just to make sure you're referring to Sitsi Masiwa, who is co-founder of Higher Life Foundation in Zimbabwe. I was just listening to Sidi, sorry for, for uh, just, I was just going to ask maybe one question I would have to the audience because we speak philanthropy in a very Western sense. The things you've been quoting, I of course, reiterate that in our space. So we've been a little bit touching upon foundations in the global south, which is now Africa. I, nobody has mentioned yet Muslim-inspired philanthropy, which is, an, if I'm correctly informed, an ever-growing space. And there are institutions like Dubai Care, uh, one could talk about, or others, or the Qatar Foundation, which is special, I know, but there are others as well. So I think it'd be really interesting to extend that conversation. I've, I don't have the knowledge, in order to doing so, but maybe somebody has here in the room to see how culturally differently inspired philanthropies join the space, which are their principles, what does impact mean to them? We, I believe, I mean, I, I suppose we have all similar learnings behind and matrices we work through, which we all share because we are of the culture we come from. 
which is Western. So I think, th to me, this is an important fact for the future of um, funding things in the Global South and dealing with people in the Global South. So that was just a reflection, but maybe somebody's got some more insights on that. Thank you. I mean, I'm just going to add some example because you're asking about our own foundations experience. So one of the foundations in Europe that indeed have that regard towards America, it's true. And we've sort of gone through a two or three years pro uh, process, not only on our Africa grant making, but the overall structure and also operational work because we are 40, 60 percent, 40 percent grant making, the rest operational. And we sort of got out of this more relaxed. Um, there were several things. We first of all found out that not everybody working in the foundation had the same understanding what impact and all that meant. You know, I think there's a, a, a bottom line to be drawn, you know, to be have everyone in the same page. And then to be relaxed that not every project you fund is going to have huge impact, you know, even though you might put a lot of funding in there. It's just, you know, it just can't be true. And so in our success stories, we've been around for 50 years, we've just become aware that as a couple, you know, we might have reached that level. So let's be relaxed and more realistic. That was the term I used before. But I think the, as you said, because you're going to, you, you said that I think um, you report to people, people got expectations, you know, we've got a grand brand. Bosch is a big brand, you know, so we need to deliver as well. So that auto produced um, pressure is something you have to deal with, you know. So our answer to that was be more realistic and accept that many of the impacts are indeed outcomes and you just are fine with that, you know. Thank you. I hope all of you, I encourage all of you to continue to the conversation and ask questions to the panelists up here. And I would like to give a round of applause for CD, Heather and Olaf for joining us today.